So we are in a series on Luke. And this is our second to last week. We're going to finish up next week. Um, And every week we've been talking about this idea of the revolution of the ordinary. That when the divine meets the ordinary, everything changes. That when, when Jesus, when you engage with Jesus with, with his words, that you should be disrupted. That in some way, as we read the words of Jesus, as we read what he did, as we go through the Gospel of Luke, the good news and victories of Jesus, according to Luke, you should be disrupted in some way. So that's what we've been talking about. And every week, we've been going through one or two chapters. And Luke, so Luke, Luke went around and interviewed people. He, 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 he made an account of what happened while Jesus was here. He wrote down all these stories, and he, was, he wrote down a lot of stories. And here's the thing is every chapter has like four or five sermons in it. I'm not even kidding. We could spend like a year in Luke and, and be fine um, and have lots of things to talk about. It'd be great. And we're doing it in like two months. So every week we're doing one or two chapters, and I talked about a few weeks ago about how like I had trouble picking which story to do. Last week was a little easier because we did 15 and 16, and 15 is just the lost sheep and the lost coin and then the lost son. And so we just, I just talked about the lost son, and that was great because I could cover the, basically the whole chapter, chapter 15, with these three stories uh, by talking about one of them. So that, that was last week. That was two chapters. This week, because of some scheduling stuff, um, we are going to be in Luke chapter 17 to 21. Anybody do some quick math real quick? How many is that? Five books. 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Five chapters, sorry. We are going to cover five chapters today. And I had a really hard time with that. Because you know what? Like the whole book of Luke is, is beautiful and we could spend a year and those five chapters have all these really cool stories. Uh, my daughter has a book about uh, the blind man receiving sight and she loves that book. And I thought, oh, I could bring that book and read that book to you guys and that'd be cool. That's in here. Um, the little children come to Jesus. Like G- Jesus says, let the little children come to me. That's in here. Uh, the sinner's prayer where the Pharisee stands up and says, uh, Thank you, God, that I am not like this man over here who's a sinner, and he's awful, and I'm great. And then the sinner says, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And it's just, it's beautiful and rich, and it's five chapters of stuff. And I just could not figure out what to talk about. And it was made even more hard by, by the fact that I talked to Rod on last Sunday, and he said he had already written his sermon for today. Because he's preaching tonight, so you can come back and listen to his sermon. But uh, we had Pilgrim Group on Thursday, which is our, our Bible studies, our men and women's Bible studies. And we're going through the, the, the study on Isaiah 61. And in the second, in the second chapter of that study, um, it talks about Jer- Jeremiah 29. And how Jeremiah 29 is this is a really pivotal, it's a, it's a key foundational part of the village of our mission. So what's our, what's our mission, buddy? Healing the city one person at a time. That's our, our mission. Our mission is healing the city one person at a time. And Jeremiah 29, 29 speaks about that. And here's a little plug. You can listen to our new Healing the City podcast. Um, which is really great because we get to hear stories of what people are doing in our community. We get to hear stories of, of healing in people's lives. And it's been really rich so far, and you should listen to it. And we're going to come back to that later. But healing the city, one person at a time, this is our, our mission statement. And Jeremiah, let's read Jeremiah 29 because I keep talking about it and I haven't read it. So we're going to come back to Luke, I promise. We'll get, we'll get around to it. Um, Okay, so Jeremiah 29 says, I forgot my water again. Can I have my water? I feel like I do this. No, no, it's, it's like sitting right there, I think. Is it not? 
Okay, I'll keep talking. All right, Jeremiah 29. This is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says to all those I carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Build houses and settle down. Plant gardens and eat what they produce. Marry and have sons and daughters. Find wives for your sons and give your daughters in marriage so that they too may have sons and daughters. Increase in number there. Do not decrease. Also, seek the peace and prosperity of the city to which I have carried you into exile. Pray to the Lord for it, because if it prospers, you too will prosper. Well, this one's not mine, but that's okay. It's my wife's water bottle. So my wife, Lane, tells this story. And she says she doesn't tell it very often, but I've heard it many times, um, about a a drumming circle, which is just our congregational meeting that we had um, when I wasn't here. That was like 11, 12 years ago, something like that. I don't know. I don't know all the details. It was a while ago. But it was right around the time we had a group of uh, college students who were going to graduate. um, And Eric, as Lane tells it, Again, if I get some details wrong, that's okay. But Lane tells this story about Eric bringing up Jeremiah 29 and this passage and saying, you should stay in Tucson. You should root yourself in Tucson and be here and pray for the city and invest in the city. And I would argue that we've done that. So there was, a, there was a week about five years ago, we had like four people in the band and I think three spouses of band members and the preacher and the spouse of the preacher and then like three other people. It was during the summer, it was really small. Now we have two services um, and it's largely a completely different group of people. We've grown in number. We have, let's see here. Build houses, so we have some people who, who build houses. Ryan, hey Ryan. Ryan helped fix my house. Uh, build houses and settle down. Plant gardens, guess what? We have a garden. That's great. It also says eat what they produce. Hey, guess what I had for dinner yesterday? I had a salad that was made with lettuce from our garden. Yay, that's great. Marry and have sons and daughters. All right. So a lot of people who were there at the time have since gotten married. It's great. We've also had a lot of kids. A lot of kids. And not only have we had a lot of kids out of our our marriages, but we've also um, brought in foster kids um, that have come in and out of our church. We've brought in, we've had people who have adopted kids. We have grown it also says, find wives for your sons. Guess what? Jesse is an original village kid. He got married. Um, his wife was brought by my wife uh, to the village. Uh, let's see here. Daniel, he's an original village kid. He got married. Fiona, wait, wait hold on. It says, uh, so it says, find wives for your sons. And give your daughters in marriage. Hey, we're doing it. We're doing it. We're doing Jeremiah 29. This is great. I want you to hold on to that. That, that the village has invested in the city. That we've done good things. Like there's, there's literal ways that we have lived out this passage. But then also, we have engaged in in praying for the peace and the prosperity of the city. Uh, This is a good thing. Healing the city one person at a time. This is our mission statement. This is a good thing that we have been doing. And I want you to hold on to that as we go to Luke and read, um, read this story again and what follows. So we're in Luke 19. This is the triumphal entry. Um, so this, is, this happens a week before 
um, Jesus is arrested and crucified. This is a week before he died. And, and we actually usually, uh, traditionally, you read this passage the week before Easter. Um, it's Palm Sunday, right? This is the triumphal entry. Triumphant entry. Triumphal? Triumphal entry. After Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going to Jerusalem. So, so Jesus has been teaching. He's been teaching a lot of stuff. As he approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying, go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Tell him, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, Why are you untying the colt? They replied, The Lord needs it. They brought it to Jesus, threw their cloaks on the colt, and put Jesus on it. As he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. What a beautiful passage. This is a really rich moment. Can you imagine being, I always wondered if Jesus just knew the guy who had the cult and had arranged it beforehand. Um, because the disciples going and just being like, hey, the Lord needs your horse. Just seems weird to me. And maybe Jesus, maybe Jesus knew the guy. I don't know. Or maybe it wasn't. Maybe the guy, they said the Lord needs it. And he was like, very faithful, trusting man. I don't know. It's just an interesting passage. But the Lord needs your colt. So here comes Jesus riding on a colt into Jerusalem. And the people surround him. And it says that the disciples... But this isn't just like the 12 disciples. This is all the followers of Jesus. These are all the people who have been following him. People are coming in from the villages. They're coming out. They hear that people in Jerusalem hear that he's coming, and they come out to see him. This is a giant crowd of people surrounding Jesus and cheering and saying, Glory in the highest, the king has come. The king has come. And that, that's true. The king had come. The Messiah had come. The one who was going to save, the one who the Lord was going to send to save his people, this is Jesus. He is the king. We've been talking a lot about how the, the words of Jesus should disrupt you. Well, in this moment, it's not the words of Jesus that disrupt the Pharisees, but the words of the people. Because the Pharisees are nervous. And it says, some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones will cry out. The Pharisees are, are kind of nervous because here comes a king to Jerusalem riding on a donkey and the people are cheering that the king was coming. Here's the thing, is right around the time of Jesus, around like in like the hundred years surrounding Jesus, there are like three other guys who stand up and say, I am the Messiah. There's like three other people who stand up and say, I'm the king. And they rise up, they say, I'm, gonna, I'm the king, let's go. And they go and they try to defeat the Romans. And they all lose, they all die. So you can understand why the Pharisees would be nervous. Because here comes a king. All these people are following him. He's he's coming up and everyone's saying he's the king. This this guy's going to rise up. He's going to go against the Romans and he's going to try to kick him out. And then the Romans have this giant army and they're going to come and they're going to hit us back. The Pharisees are nervous. But Jesus knows what he's come to do. And he doesn't tell them to be quiet because he says, if they are quiet, 
even the stones will cry out. The truth of Jesus, who he was, would be known, even if the people didn't say it. But here comes the king. Here comes the king. They speak what is true, and yet they did not understand. Because Jesus didn't rise up against the room. It's funny because that's how we engage with Jesus a lot, huh? We walk around and we say he's the king. We cheer him on. We sing hallelujah, praise the Lord. And then we have all these expectations of what he's going to do. We have all these things that we think he's going to do. You know, if you, you went out into the city, the, the fact is that if you talk to people and you ask them about Jesus, like 99% of them would say, oh yeah, Jesus was a good guy. He's cool. Or I believe in Jesus. Or, you know, he, he had some good things to say and he was, he was a cool guy. And very few people are going to tell you that, that they don't like him. That they think he was awful. They might tell you that they don't like his followers sometimes. But they're not going to say they don't like Jesus. They know what's true about Jesus even if they don't know the whole truth. They know what's true about Jesus. As he approached Jerusalem and saw the city, he wept over it and said, If you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, But now it is hidden from your eyes. The days will come upon you when your enemies will build an embankment against you and encircle you and hem you in on every side. They will dash you to the ground, you and the children within your walls. They will not leave one stone on another because you did not recognize the time of God's coming to you. Can you feel the tension of this moment? Imagine... You're walking alongside Jesus. You've been following him for years and he's finally coming to Jerusalem. And your your people are finally going to be free from the oppression of the Romans and he's coming in and you're cheering him on. You're saying, glory in the highest. Here comes the king. And you look over at Jesus and he's weeping. And he's weeping. The tension of that moment Forty years later, another man, one of, one of the people I was talking about, rose up and said that he was the king. And the Romans said, I've had enough of this. We've had enough of this. And they came in and they did this. They did what, what Jesus says right here. They came in and they destroyed Jerusalem. They killed a ton of people. They, they, knocked, they destroyed the temple. Jesus, in the midst of the cheering, in the midst of the the cries of who he was, this really rich moment of people acknowledging the truth about Jesus is weeping for what will be. Is weeping for, for what will happen because he knows that within a week, they're all going to abandon him, they're all going to walk away, and he's going to suffer and die. He's not going to rise up against the Romans. He's not going to kick off Roman rule. He's establishing a different kind of kingdom. A kingdom which we get to participate in. So here's the invitation. The invitation this week is to go out into the city. Because we here at the village, we are not an island unto ourselves. We aren't isolated from what happens in this city. And we could talk about the we could talk about everything happening around the world. We could talk about what happens what's happening in in Mexico or in Syria or in Washington DC or in China. And some of us are more engaged in those things than others. What's happening in Mexico is going to be more deeply meaningful to me 
because that's where I grew up. That's where I'm from. That's where the people who brought me to Jesus, who introduced me to his love, who told me that I had something valuable to offer, they're there. So that's deeply meaningful to me. And we can see the world around us and see what's happening. But I want to invite you in this moment, because all of you are in Tucson, even if you're only here for a visit, um, even if you're only here for a short time, for two years, or one year, or if you've been here your whole life and you don't know when you're going to leave, or if you moved here a few years ago but you have no plans to leave, you're in Tucson. And I want you to see not what will happen, because it's not what will happen to Tucson. It's what is happening to Tucson. The kingdom is established, and we live here, and we get to go out in, into the world and bring the kingdom of Christ with us. And we get to see what is happening in Tucson. The brokenness here. The poverty. The homelessness. The drug addiction. The trafficking. The corruption the brokenness of the people around us, we engage with that. You go to your jobs, you go to the coffee shop, you go to a restaurant, you go to the grocery store, it's palpable. You can feel the brokenness of the city, the brokenness of the people around you. In the, the Healing the City podcast, um, I think it came out a, a couple weeks ago. I just listened to it last week. Um, Eric and Amanda and Adrian were talking about dysregulation and stress and trauma, and they're talking about the brokenness of people. And at the end of the podcast, it ended with this. We're going to listen to three minutes of it. Um, Amanda started talking about brokenness, and I'm I'm just going to let that go, and then I have a few thoughts about that. So let's against our bodies you know i was talking to my sister last night and we were talking about like the aging process and how like internally i'm like um i don't feel like i'm almost 40 and she's like oh my god i'm already in my 40s and i don't feel like i'm 40 either like what's up with that and she gave me this great thought that uh, i think came from c.s lewis that we are irreconciled to time we were not created to be bound by time and yet we are now right and so there is a tension that will always remain in that it's beautiful yeah. And I think that that comes into play with our bodies in that we were not we were not intended to be bound by our bodies in the way that we currently are. And we see that from in scripture like after the fall that now they are now subject to disease and death in a way that they weren't before the fall. Yes. And so we are now subject to our bodies. So we think we have to embrace that and just recognize the fact that that is um, a part of who we are, and it is a part of God's creation, and it is broken, and it's something that he wants to redeem, right? But the kingdom has not yet come, and so I think the way that we, we show up in this, in kingdom living, is by embracing and acknowledging the fact that, yes, we are living in broken bodies and broken vessels, and if you stop fighting it and instead you nurture it and you care for it and you just offer the brokenness to Jesus and allow him to sit with you in the sadness and the sorrow of that, but we don't want to do that, right? No. So like I frequently will sit with people and, and get them to the core identity. You know, like I, w I was sitting with, with some clients and, and we dug down through all this stuff and they said, you know, I don't want to regulate this stuff. I don't want to stop yelling and screaming because underneath it all, I know that I'm really broken. Mm. My core identity is that wow. I'm broken. That's, that's a major insight. Yeah, it was really good insight. And so I said, you know what? You are. You are. And if you can learn how to sit with that, you're going to be in a much better place than if you try to fight it. Hmm. She said, you know what? Nobody has ever said that to me before. Anytime I've ever told somebody that, a counselor or a friend or anybody, they say, you're not broken, you're not broken, you're not broken, you're beautiful, you're wonderful, and you just have to believe that. 
but it's not the truth. Hmm. Wow. They are, we are broken. We are broken. We are broken, but that doesn't mean we're worthless. Right. And it doesn't mean we're unredeemable. Right. I think we should end there. All right. That That's was good. beautiful. Thanks, Jake. You've been listening. You should listen to the podcast. It's really good. You are broken, but that does not mean you are worthless. It does not mean you are irredeemable. We should be weeping at what's happening in Tucson. We should be weeping when we go out into the city. We should be with Jesus, engaging with the heart of Jesus, with his compassion, at what is happening in our city. But in the midst of that, in the midst of the compa- in the midst of the, the weeping and the compassion and the brokenness, there is an acknowledgement that what Jesus came to do was to redeem it. So our city is, is broken, and we are called to it. We are called to healing the city. We are called to, to go out from this place and engage with people and bring Jesus to those people and engage with them in, in the kingdom. And to acknowledge that we are broken, that the people around us are broken, that this city is broken, but this city is not worthless and is not irredeemable. And we get to participate in the healing of this city. There's hope. So I w- what I want to invite you to this week is to weep over the city, to engage with compassion with Jesus at what is happening in our city, and then also to engage with hope. Because it's really easy to see all those problems and then to despair. But that's not what Jesus offers. Jesus doesn't offer despair. He does not despair over Jerusalem. He weeps over Jerusalem, but then he brings redemption. And so, weep over what's happening in the city. Participate in it. Not participate in it, but engage with it. Engage with the brokenness. And then bring hope. Hold on to hope that what Jesus offers is healing and what we bring with us along with Jesus, is healing. I have a few minutes for questions or responses. I don't know where the microphone is. I noticed, like, way at the beginning with the cult, it's never been written before, so it's like still wild. But Jesus just sat on it and just went calmly into the city. It, because if you just sat on a cult that's never been written before, I'll just buck you right off. But it didn't. And I just thought that was amazing. Yeah. Thanks, Rosie. Okay, I have two questions. The first one isn't really that serious, but it's been bugging me. Okay, so that top left picture and the bottom third from the left picture, yeah, what are those? Third from the left? On the bottom row. On the bottom row. Because that looks like an intestine to that me one? with a bug nearby. Leprosy bandages. Leprosy and spiders. bandages. Okay, and that top left one, what's that? What's the top left one? Yeah, yeah, top. A shepherd's crook. Very good. Okay. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ashton. Ashton, by the way, does almost all of our sermon series slides. She's a great artist. Thank, Thank you. you. My other question goes back to Jeremiah 29. You know, the from verse 4 down to verse 6, that's a prescription, essentially, about like how we should establish ourselves in community. But verse 7 is more vague. It says, seek the peace and prosperity of the city. And you had said, we should weep 
we should engage the city's brokenness and we should have hope instead of despair. But like, can you talk about like, what does that, what does that really look like physically? Because if I said build, build a house, how that would look physically is like you would get materials for a house and then you'd start building it. What is praying for the peace and prosperity or seeking the peace and prosperity of the city? Yeah. I think the the difference between despair and hope is that despair inherently turns inward and is um, is is self seeking and hope turns us outward um, and so in our hope we we engage with people and seek to bring healing rather than retreating from them because they're broken. I think seeking the peace and the prosperity of the city is actually being willing to have eyes to see what is broken and to engage with it. To go into our jobs and be willing. I got to hear a story this week about a guy looking for his wallet and he went to Taco Bell and there's a woman sitting outside of Taco Bell and he sat with her and prayed for her like, and stopped looking for his wallet because he was looking because he, he saw this this woman like there's a being willing to to see what is and and to engage with it and not run away from it um. to me the like i like recipes for things because i don't have to be as vulnerable like if i'm baking bread like i'll just follow the recipe and if it doesn't come out right it's like well i follow the recipe so i don't have to feel that negativity it was but the recipe's like, fault yeah yeah uh, well but with this it's like go out and engage the brokenness of the city like i feel like what's required of me is okay like here i am in the city with no recipe or prescription for its healing like maybe i'm meant to go outside of a taco bell and talk to a person or whatever sort of like spontaneous equivalent i think i think yeah i mean i think sometimes it is spontaneous sometimes it is the way we engage with our, some people have certain jobs that lead them to that. David? I've kind of noticed there's there's a couple of distinct and sometimes warring motives in my heart. One being uh, excitedly joining and seeking in, to join what Jesus is doing in the city. And the other is to get God off my back and do enough service projects to, you know, <laughs> to check off the boxes. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's really valuable to look at where my heart is when I'm engaging in whatever activity. Yeah, well, I think that the important thing is, is acknowledging that I'm not the one who brings healing. That we participate in the healing of city, in the healing of the city, in the conversations that we have, in the way that we engage with people. But it is not, like we are not actually the ones who bring healing. The person who brings healing is Jesus. And that may work through us, but Rod? And the, the formula is love, right? So I look at the person and I love them just where they're at, what they're doing. I don't, and so then what What do I offer them? There is no recipe for that thing, and you're gonna mess it up, and you can't heal everybody, which is, I think, the one person at a time thing is really important, yeah. because I drive by a lot of pain and suffering and struggle, and I can't solve that problem, but in seeking the good of the city, I can find small things to do. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like um, one thing that kind of, I don't know, takes that guilt away is be just being um, sensitive to the Holy Spirit and what he's, like, nudging you to do. And it's really, um, I feel like he'll make it obvious, you know, if he's, as long as you're open to hearing it, that, um, you know, oh, it's this person. You know, if you feel like you should go over to that, go over to that person. You know, like, but it's not, like, every single person you see because you might not have what they need, you know, and, and God might have a different person with a different gift that's going to help them. And, um, it's so easy to get overwhelmed by brokenness, but I think just being open to what the Holy Spirit is, uh, nudging you to do. Yeah. I think there's a, there's probably a, an entire different ser sermon about being willing to be inconvenienced. Um, I was <clears throat> also here when, and not married, when Eric preached this sermon, and I was dating Steve and called him and 
like told him the sermon over the phone and said, we, we need to stay here. You need to come and let's, because this is exciting. I want to be a part of this. And so it's really fun to come back to it and remember it. And it's, I also think it's a part of, like it's an invitation, not just for the people that were there. It feels like it's God's word to us now, you know, and for our community. And just, I think one of the things I really heard you saying or that stuck out when you read verse 5 when it says build homes and plan to stay. I just, it's really, I just hear that invitation of being present. Like, because God might call, you know, at some point he might call somebody to somewhere else. But I just really love that invitation of plan to stay. And I hear that as being a part of the being present and seeing the people at our work or neighbors or Taco Bell of like, well, I'm here, and so I want to be a part of seeing the people and engaging. So I just, that's what I hear the Spirit reminding me of. Thanks, Hannah. One more, and then, or maybe two. One or two. Um, I, I just really like, I think the key and to the, what it looks like to seek the city is what you've already said in your sermon is to weep with Jesus. When your heart is with Jesus' heart, it's not hard to know what he's doing. I, I think that a lot of times my heart is not with Jesus, and so it's very hard for me to see deep down what he's doing in other people's lives and in our community. And so I, I appreciate the challenge to align my heart with Jesus. That's, that's a big deal. Yeah. One more. No? Okay. Oh, yeah. Andrea. One more. Thanks, David. <laughs> I find the hoping part the most difficult of it all. To sit and weep with people and have hope that God is going to do something, and maybe that something is just to be with them, I can do that. But I somehow define the hope differently when it comes to my son Ian. Mm -hmm. I want that hope to be that he's going to heal him and he's going to bring him through this and make him even stronger in the Lord and, I don't know, deliver this transformation. And I only, I define it, the hope, a different way when it comes to, you know, in my family or in somebody close. Whereas I can accept the generality of what hope might look like for somebody else. So I don't want to hope for yeah. the people I really love and I'm close to because then I have to wait for that hope to be dashed and that's just too painful. Yeah. So yeah. I, I need some prayers for that. I mean, I, I do think, I think there's a, a, I think there's something deeply meaningful in the fact that Jesus didn't silence them. Even though he knew what they were hoping for and what they thought they were declaring. And Jesus may have different plans, like for Ian, than what you hope for. But that doesn't mean that you then hope or give up what you hope for. And I mean, I, I do think what Amanda said in the podcast is deeply meaningful, that, that we are broken, but that brokenness does not mean that we are worthless or irredeemable. Thanks. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your word. I pray that this week you would give us uh, hearts aligned with yours, that you would give us uh, your compassion and your eyes to see, that we would um, weep over what is um, and hope for something better. Amen.